Hello and welcome to Navigating Nursing. I am your host, Laura Whitehead, a registered adult nurse, a critical care nurse, qualified lecturer and fellow of the Higher Education Academy. I would like to welcome Tim Kuhn, who is a trainee, advanced critical care practitioner, an intensive care nurse and a critical care flight nurse. Welcome, Tim. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. We're going to go back to your university days you qualified in 2008 and you went to Middlesex University which is where I lecture now but what made you decide on nursing and why did you pick Middlesex University in particular? First of all thanks for having me on um, the reason uh, I picked Middlesex was really because um, good option for um, for being able to live at home and not have to pay for student accommodation and then going to the university. I also had a place at City University as well, situation reasons is the reason I went to Middlesex and it was near my house. And the third reason or last reason is also because I'd um, done some work experience at the Whittington. So I had had experience working in that hospital and that's where Middlesex uh, had one uh, of their placement options. When did you decide on nursing? When I was 10, I joined Central Ambulance as a volunteer, so I was a cadet. So I started working with a lot of people, um, so nurses, doctors, paramedics, uh, doing first aid at local events like sporting events and um, things like the London Marathon, etc. So I think really from then, that's kind of when I got really into sort of like healthcare um, and wanting to to work in that field. Um, obviously, at 10, I didn't really exactly know what I wanted to do, but then... Um, I so got you didn't quietly have the career path out. <laughs> no, no, 10 years old, like, maybe when I was 11. Um, <laughs> uh, but then I, I, so when I did my GCSEs, I kind of pretty much knew that's what I wanted to do. I left GCSEs, I didn't, so I did my GCSEs, left um, school, didn't do A-levels, was a step nursing, so I did an NVQ in care, and worked um, part, did some placements as like a healthcare assistant um, at the Whittington doing that. So I did an NVQ, which was like equivalent to um, A-levels. And that was really like a, my first proper taster into, into nursing before I went and did um, university. So you knew what you were getting into then? <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've done a very wide variety of roles. Looking at your CV, you've been a band five in intensive care. You've been a band six band seven charge nurse which is when I met you at the Royal London um you've been outreach in the hospital at night you've been a PDN and now you're a trainee critical care advanced critical care practitioner what has been your favorite role so far and why I think that's a really hard one um I think I've enjoyed all those roles for different reasons um and what I've tried to do is have although I all my kind of work has been generally in intensive care I've kind of had try to have a little variety one's really really hard I did enjoy the PDN role um, because I think doing the PDN role you get to know um, a lot of different people in the trust mm -hmm. uh, you get to know how things work um, you come out of this you come out of the bubble that sometimes is an in intensive care and you you see what's going on and it developed some other skills like teaching skills which I hadn't really had to do you know teaching um, other nurses and, and my primary role when I started in the PDN job was to induct um, about 90 Spanish and Italian nurses that we had recruited um, from overseas so I really enjoyed that and it was great to meet new people so I would that was that was a highlight of the jobs I've done so far. And you started at the Homerton Intensive Care as a band five newly qualified um, and you'd never actually done a placement within intensive care during your training. How did you find the application process? How did you find applying for that role and then starting in the intensive care? So when I started in intensive care, I didn't really know what to expect. And, and sort of naively, I thought that on day one, I was going to, you know, be asked to, you know, set a ventilator up and look for yeah. a ventilator. Run it all on your own, do CPR with one arm. <laughs> yeah, which <laughs> uh, really wasn't the case. Um, and um, I had done some work as a healthcare assistant on ITU, uh, just a bit of bank, roughly what happened there. Most places, I think, and certainly at the Homerton, they had an induction programme. They knew they were, uh, obviously, they knew I was newly qualified, along with some other people that started there. Um, so I got an induction period. I got some supernumerary time these days for uh, new ITU starters. But we had a similar uh, sort of competency package um, that we worked through. So, so I would say I was nervous, um, like anyone starting a new job, didn't know really what to expect. But I think it was good. 
you know, it's a good unit to start and it was quite, it's quite a small unit. Um, so it was good to, um, to start there and, and sort of build up, up from there to somewhere like the Royal London, where, <laughs> as you know, can be a bit busy. It is the opposite of a small unit. <laughs> Um, one of the things for anyone listening is that if you don't have the placement or the experience in the area in, in kind of a full time or a placement uh, opportunity that actually doing bank shifts or doing healthcare assistant shifts, I did them in A&E because that was kind of the area I thought I wanted to go into um, when I was a student. I thought it's a really useful thing to get the experience, to get to know the department, to know people and as well to help with your application and to kind of support that process. So that's a really good point to take away. Yeah, one so, thing I one thing I, it's one thing I would say though is um, something I was advised and I think it's good advice is that is not to do um, bank shifts in an area where you're working currently as a student mm-hmm. um, just because I think it can get a bit confusing because one day if you're doing work as a healthcare assistant there's mm-hmm. a different expectation of you than as a student so I never did bank I did a lot of bank when I was a student but I never did bank in an area where I was currently a a student nurse. Yeah, and that's a really good piece of advice for everyone to take away. Thank you. So you've done, we were talking just before we started, you've done a lot of courses. And one of them that I know that you did while you were at the Royal London, while I was there, um, was your MSc that you did as a distance master's um, in trauma sciences. How did you find that process doing a course kind of purely online um, from a distance point of view? So I think um, it's challenging. I'm, uh, what I found out from that, course is that I'm not very good at working from home um <laughs> I need to be in a in a university setting or or in an office setting um to do that so you've got to be quite disciplined at home and at master's level there's an expect of my dissertation there was very little contact with the university just with your supervisor really um who would check that you're you know you're going along the, the, the right route but the actual course itself was really good the, the first year uh, was sort of, uh, about eight modules that online is obviously you don't have to travel into the university you get access to kind of world-class speakers because it's online you know uh, collaborating with people across the world who are um, interested or, or specialists in trauma in, in trauma so access to all these specialists where you ne- you might not necessarily get that on a face-to-face talk course at, at a university. Can you tell me more about your current role so you are now a trainee advanced critical care practitioner it's a very new role. Yeah so as you, you're right so um, advanced practice in general is fairly new and especially in intensive care I would say in intensive care it's in, in the UK it's probably only been around for the last um, 10 years or so so basically what we do is uh, we work primarily with the medical team uh, using sort of the experience and skills that we have from um, our previous backgrounds we do a lot of jobs that traditionally uh, doctors would do so um, in the case of intensive care we um, put lines in so central lines bath caths arterial lines we see patients on the ward round, we present them to the consultant, uh, we liaise with other teams for referrals, etc. And so that's kind of what we do day to day. In terms of the training, uh, we have done uh, an adva- a postgraduate diploma in advanced critical care practice, and that's included the advanced physical assessment module, uh, physiology module, and the prescribing course. So the idea generally is that advanced practice really came around to kind of help with well, to help the gaps in uh, medical rotors and also to sort of develop people that, like me, nurses that wanted to sort of advance their clinical skills to quite a high level, had already done or didn't necessarily want to go down the outreach route. This is another another option. And just to say, sort of in, in the case of advanced critical care practitioners, we are a mixture of backgrounds. So I obviously have a background as a nurse, but we also have a physiotherapist working with us and a paramedic. So you can come from different backgrounds within healthcare to then do this course. Wow, I didn't realise it was other professions. I just thought it was it was just registered nurses. It's yeah. Very interesting. Because as well, lots of the posts, if you kind of hit that band seven level, uh, a lot of the, the roles can be quite managerial, can't they? And kind of take you away from the clinical practice side. So the advanced nurse practitioner role can allow that contact time and that development of those skills further. Yeah, it's quite it's quite difficult to find a, a, a role at band seven level or, or above that is purely clinical. A lot of it involves management. And so the ACCP, if you want to, if you want to do a role that is purely, pretty much purely clinical, 
that and you want to do that in critical care then ACCP is the way to go really. and did you apply through a particular trust did you sit on NHS jobs how did you find out about the opportunity I always keep an eye out on NHS jobs not because I'm constantly looking to move job but just to see what's out there really and, and what's going on and to and to look for opportunities elsewhere um, so yeah so I applied directly to where to the hospital I'm working now, where which advertised the job and uh, applied through that job, and then separately uh, you have to apply to the university then to do the university course. But there's they often have an arrangement with the employer that if you get a place in in the trust, then you would get a place in the university. And I think even the um, there was a representative from the university at the interview for the job so so you also work as a flight critical care nurse um can you just expand a little bit about that i think it's an opportunity that people might not have heard that much about before yeah so flight nursing um there's different ways you can do it and different types of flight nursing and what i do is i work for a company um, on an ad hoc basis basically when i'm free and before covid we were doing mainly insurance jobs so we would go and to a lot of places in Europe so we'd go to the Canary Islands a lot for example then repatriate holiday makers uh, UK holiday makers that had become ill uh, on on holiday and weren't able to get a normal commercial flight back to the UK uh, so we would go either with a, another nurse or a paramedic or a doctor we'd have a full intensive care kit with us uh, and then we can take back anyone from a patient that can walk onto the plane but has some reason they can't take a commercial flight to a level three fully ventilated um, critically unwell patient back to the UK. Um, so that's what we were doing uh, pre-COVID. Um, now, because of COVID and uh, obviously people aren't going on holiday as much, um, we are pretty much exclusively just doing um, repatriation from the Channel Islands, so Guernsey and Jersey. And the reason we do that is because on Guernsey and Jersey, they don't have the specialist services such as cardiac and neuro, etc. To manage a patient there so if a patient for example has a heart attack um, usually they have to come over to um, Southampton the hospital there where they can be managed further and have various investigations done so so we go across in a in a dedicated uh, air ambulance little small aircraft um, over to go into your jersey um, go to the hospital pick the patient up uh, manage them um, en route in the aircraft back to uh, Southampton and then hand them over to the hospital at Southampton. So slightly less exotic locations at the moment um, yeah. but we'll have our fingers crossed that normal service will return soon. Yeah. There's a, there's a, I think there's a um, when you say flight nursing there's this assumption that it's very glamorous but yeah. a lot of the time you're, you're on your knees crawling around a small aircraft uh, hitting your head <laughs> times. Um, See I'm imagining so a bit of a top gun kind of jumpsuit cool helmet um, situation but no well, I imagine it's not. That's what I see when I look in the mirror but I'm not sure <laughs> It's not the case, unfortunately. And you also, I don't know how you find time for this, um, you also volunteer with St John's. And you, has your role changed a lot within St John's and do you still uh, manage to somehow fit this in around your career as well? So I've done a lot of different roles in St John. Um, obviously, I started off as a cadet, then, you know, transitioned into being an adult member, ran a cadet unit, so a unit that has, uh, a meeting unit that has um, kids from age 10 to 18 in it. And then I did some sort of work in the youth team and then took on a role as like an area manager, which is where you're managing a set of units within a certain area. And now I'm working within the clinical department. So I'm kind of the lead for infection control in uh, our region, which is how we divide the organisation. And that is um, London and South region. So um, it's London and then places like Sussex, etc., is where our region kind of expands to so that's kind of my main role and then I still do go out as at events as an now as an event nurse um, so basically that's basically me going out as a nurse to an event and supporting the other first aiders etc that are there but, but again because of COVID our event workers gone down a bit or quite a lot so now we're doing more we're doing more work to support the ambulance service so we deploy a number of ambulances each day which go and respond to 999 calls so I'm starting to do some of that now so I was out on Saturday and responding to 999 calls 
So it's just something, uh, it's something that I've done since I was 10. So it's kind of a bit like my social life as well now, because mm. that's obviously how a lot of friends that do it. Um, but also, again, it's just something different. I, I think it's really important in your career to have different experiences. And I think that makes you a stronger person and also better at your job. So, so I think having that variety uh, and doing different roles is really, really important. I think cause you, we were talking said earlier about being in a bubble in intensive care. And I think especially when you've worked in the same speciality for a while, you become quite comfortable, don't you? You know, the type of patients that are going to come in, you know, all the doctors, you know, all the staff. And actually by kind of the extracurricular things you do and the fact that you've also, you know, moved units into this new role, you're pushing yourself and kind of learning those new skills, especially the nine and nine calls. That's, you know, that's not a skill that you would have used previously working in the intensive care necessarily. Yeah, and I think it, I think it make or well, helps you think outside the box as well. So when you come up a problem at work, um, you use your skills that you know you've gained from elsewhere to think about outside the box. How can we manage the situation? And equally, when you're you know responding to nine 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 calls because you've got your work experience, you you kind of thinking at the outside the box about how we would do things as well. You know, an example of that is when you're in the aircraft, you're very limited in terms of space and stuff. Um, so it kind of makes you think of you know I haven't got a nice big bed space like I do on intensive care where I can lay out all my drugs and my you know my infusions and stuff. So you have to kind of think you know how how you can adapt your practice um, in that environment so I think I think it gives you those non-clinical skills which are really important as well um, and have you got any advice for any newly qualified or any nurses at the moment some pearls of wisdom from your career so far that you'd like to pass on <laughs> I think I think I would say that if you uh, if you're not sure where you want to work or what field you want to go in try and get onto like a rotation program there are a lot of trusts now which offer rotations where you do sort of six months in you know A&E six months in ITU or six months on the medical ward six months on the surgical ward so I think that would be really good to to um to get that experience in different areas but on the other hand I would say if you if you know that you want to work in a certain area um, then just go for it so I was uh, told when I was looking for an intensive care job that I should go and get six months experience on a ward first by a lot of nurses but I kind of ignored their advice um, because I knew that <laughs> I knew that I wanted to do um, either uh, work in A&E or ITU and I, I haven't looked back I haven't regretted it I, I you know I did some I did a couple of bank shifts on a ward when I first qualified and it was all right it was fine um, but I didn't I've never felt in my career that I needed that six months experience on award. But I think if you're, as I said, I think if you're um, if you're unsure about what you want to do, then you should definitely try and join some rotation programme. And the other thing is just don't don't think about it too much because everyone, when you start uh, as a newly qualified nurse, people know you're newly qualified. So they're not going to be expecting you to, you know, be all singing and all dancing when you start. You know, there, there's going to be some expectation that, yeah, you are going to, have to ask questions and you're not going to know things and stuff and it's very different being a third year student nurse on your final placement to then being a qualified nurse I'm sure you're, you'll agree so there very is different. you do get some um, some leeway with that it's not that you're going to be expected to know everything and, and be able to do everything when you when you first start off so take it easy. I think as well I think we put too much pressure on ourselves don't we as nurses that we're supposed to know everything or we're supposed to be doing I don't know a course all the time or we're supposed to be progressing where actually you're right you can give yourself a bit of a break and even if the job you pick when you first qualify isn't going to be your forever job that's okay you yeah. can stay in the post for you know six months you can stay in there for a year get your preceptorship done and then move on to a, to a role that an area that you're interested in. Yeah like you've got your you know if you think you're if people are qualifying and they're in there you know I qualified when I was 21 mm. um, and you've got so, your whole you know, you've got your whole career ahead of you so you've got time uh, and if someone uh, said when I was 21 I would be doing this this job now I would now I would never have believed you yeah, um, exactly same, yeah. We've, we've got no idea where where we're kind of going to end up do we even if yeah. even if you're a bit of a planned person and you've got an eye you've got you know you know you knew you wanted to go into intensive care I knew I wanted to be in the high dependency unit or an A&E so I had a bit of an idea but I would never have guessed ever that that this would be where this would where I'd be or can guess where my job was going to go in the future really yeah exactly yeah I think you know it's like you said I don't if if someone told me 12 years ago you know in 12 years time you're going to be putting central lines in and prescribing drugs yeah. so you know, I wouldn't 
I believe them. So things in the NHS do change and, and there are new jobs that are created. And so take your time and, and just think about what you want to do. And and the other thing I would say, the last thing I would say for a newly qualified is just look after yourself. You know, there's, you know, enjoy. I know it's, it, I'm probably not the best person to say this because I do do a lot of stuff on my uh, days off, but that's because I enjoy doing that. But you need to enjoy your days off and, and, choose something that you know you want to do that maybe is not work related turn off your you know your work emails and um you know like during lockdown when I was working I kind of went and relived my childhood and brought PlayStation started playing PlayStation again you know just because it's something just released you know that you can that is actually fun and and you know two hours later you think oh my god I've been sitting on the PlayStation for two hours but but um, you've turned your brain off haven't you I think a lot of the time I found when I qualified I found it really hard to switch off and I would be there thinking about did I give that medication right? What if I made a mistake? Did I update the notes? And it was almost like my brain was going on a loop. And yeah. a big thing for me was learning of how to like pause that, how to say, actually, you've done the shift. If there's a problem, someone will ring you. You're back tomorrow or you're back after the weekend. Yeah. And if it's PlayStation or, you know, whatever that kind of thing is that helps you kind of press press pause on the brain whirring. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff around at the moment about, you know, doing mindfulness and sp- and. And if you find that helpful, you know, people should do that. And there's loads of like free apps and stuff that you can do all of that stuff on YouTube. And, um, but just whatever it is, just find something that you, you know, that you enjoy doing and is is for you, not for for work. You know, even if it is work related, make sure it's something that you enjoy doing. Like making a podcast and doing it in your spare time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it can be work related. It doesn't have to be completely separated. But And you're right about the mindfulness. It, I don't think everyone's got, I think there can be a bit of a stigma attached of like, oh, I'm not someone that's into yoga. I'm not into meditation. It can be your version of that. And yeah, it can be sit, sat playing PlayStation. So you are coming to the end of your postgrad diploma in advanced critical care practice. What is your kind of career plan or goals once you've finished? So that's quite a difficult question. I went, even when I was a student nurse, I kind of had this idea that I wanted to be a matron by the time I was 30. So that's gone. Um, <laughs> that's but, a really uh, big goal. You were, yeah. you were aiming really high. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as I said, things change in the NHS. So I've decided to do this, which is, is, you know, what I'm doing for now. It's very difficult to say where advanced practice is going to go. It's as I said, it's still quite young, so it's possible things could could develop. When I started um, in this job, the clinical director said to us, "Where do you see yourselves in five years?" And we kind of all looked a bit blank. And he said, <laughs> "That job doesn't exist." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he said, uh, "Well, I can see you guys, you know, doing my job." And certainly now there are you know uh, clinical directors that do come from a from a nursing background so potentially that is an option um to be a clinical director coming from an advanced clinical background or advanced practice background i still like the idea of, of being a matron and that is still something i'd like to do i although i'm uh, doing a role now that is purely clinical i did enjoy um, my time when I was, you know, a band seven team leader managing a team, I really enjoy sort of developing staff, see them develop um, and and some aspects of the, of the management side. So, so I would still like to do that. So I haven't got a firm idea about what I want to do. And I never really have. I've just always, you know, looked for opportunities and then and then applied if, if that's what I want to do. So who knows? Who knows? And your advice about NHS jobs was that was and mine was the same when I was kind of knowing I was wanted to go to an education uh, role next. Of NHS jobs is a really good place. You're right to see what's out there, to see what what is new, what is being advertised, what is going on. So definitely a piece of advice for anyone that's struggling to know. <laughs> where they want to go or where they see themselves yeah because there's lots of jobs you've seen which you didn't even know exist as well that you know as I said the NHS is continually evolving and people are creating new jobs all the time um, based on how the NHS has changed so um so yeah just keep it out and, and also not just the NHS I mean I'm talking about the NHS because that's where I work but obviously there's the private sector as well um and you know the air ambulance stuff I do is is a private company um so yeah and I just found that out from talking to people and and finding out what they do and stuff so networking okay so thank you so much Tim for uh, being here today it was lovely to talk to you and, uh, good luck with the rest of your course and enjoy your newfound freedom now you're going to be done from university for a bit <laughs> I'm sure I'll find something else to do I'm sure. <laughs> to add to the list <laughs> thank you Tim